Milkfish, known to science as Chanos Chanos, is the main product of some 180,000 hectares of brackish water ponds in the Philippines. It contributes 130,000 metric tons to the country's total fish production. This is 10% of all fish produced or captured by the Philippines' fishery industry. Bangus, the local name of milkfish, is also cultured in some of the country's 300,000 hectares of inland water, more prominently in Laguna Libay, where up to 10 tons per hectare a year can be produced in combinations with carps and tilapia. Thus, the Filipino consumer purchases around one kilogram of bangus for every 10 kilos of fish he buys. Perhaps no other single species of fish can adversely affect the intake of animal protein by Filipinos as a decreased supply of bangus. The milkfish industry employs a workforce of 180,000. This is based on one person taking care of one hectare. And based on the average developmental cost of 5,000 pesos per hectare, it represents an investment of nearly 1 billion pesos. The bangus culture industry naturally generates related industries such as fry gathering, fingerling growing and fish processing, which in turn can employ several thousand more Filipinos. Not all species of fish are suitable for farming, but milkfish meets many of the criteria for assessing the suitability of farming certain animals in a developing country like the Philippines. First, it is an omnivore, meaning it feeds on both plant and animal materials, and its digestive system can adapt to a variety of diets. Because it can be reared using only plant material, it does not compete with people for trash fish that are fed to carnivorous species such as eel. It is easier and less energy to raise this kind of fish because one does not have to raise plants. Second, not only can the adults spawn about one to seven million eggs, milkfish fry are also hardy and easy to collect. Thus, only a few spawners could supply fry. And collecting area and it can be stored and transported with simple gear and distributed to fish farmers with only a few deaths. Third, because it is placed in ponds at the stage of its life when growth is geometric, Milkfish grows and survives much better than many species. Fourth, because it is resistant to disease and they do not eat their own kind, in other words, they're not cannibalistic, milkfish can be stocked in relatively high densities. This suggests that with additional inputs in terms of food, the existing land areas devoted to extensive milkfish culture can support more fish by way of a semi-intensive culture system. Its tolerance of and adaptability to widely fluctuating salinities and temperature allows its culture under a wide variety of conditions. Hence, fish farmers can be assured of a reasonable harvest under conditions when other species fail to grow or even survive. Fifth, its hardy nature and rapid growth make milkfish an efficient feed converter. The virtue of the milkfish must certainly have led our earlier fish farmers to choose it for pond culture. Research done in the 1940s to the 1960s did confirm that these factors really make milkfish a good species for aqua farming. 
fish pond acreage and production gradually increased until the late 1960s when the area devoted to culture increased by 20% and production went up by 52% all in three years. Since the early 70s, however, such spectacular growth has not been sustained. What were the problems? The milkfish industry is highly dependent on the availability and predictable supply of bungos fry. In the 1970s, the introduction of modern methods led to higher stocking rates and more crops per year. Abetted by the increase in pond acreage, demand for fry soared to high levels. Since then, the supply of fry has always been below industry requirement. At present, the estimated annual catch of 1,150 million fry, from which only about 450 million fingerlings are produced, falls way below the estimated 1.5 billion required yearly to stock the ponds. This has been the only major constraint to the continued growth of the milkfish industry. Other problems include the following. High death rate of milkfish fry during collection, storage, and rearing. High cost of feeds, fertilizers, pesticides, and other inputs. Prevalence of parasites, diseases, and pollution. Lack of financing and credit. And lack of efficient marketing. To increase production per unit area and to solve the problems of inadequate supply of fry, researchers at CIFDEC conducted studies along four objectives. Increase the supply of milkfish broodstock, generate technology for the artificial propagation of fry, refine present techniques of wild fry and fingerling collection, storage and transport, and improve and standardize culture techniques. An ideal species for aquaculture is one which can be raised in the laboratory or under controlled conditions. This situation allows scientists and farmers total control over the reproduction and growth of the species. In other words, when the life cycle of a cultured species has been closed or completed in the laboratory, researchers can then produce seeds at will by environmental or hormonal manipulations, improve stock by selective breeding, allow non-seasonal farming, and in general, permit man to manipulate the biology of the species for his benefit. Because it has been dependent on supply from the wild, Milkfish culture has never been a closed process. To supplement wild fry supply, milkfish must be bred in captivity, a difficult step as research has indeed proven. The first step in the attempts to close the cycle was the capture of wild adult milkfish or sabalo to find out whether milkfish could in fact breed in captivity using hormone injections. A massive effort to catch sabalo started in 1976. Because sexually mature fish are large and oceanic, they are difficult to catch and handle. Attempts to catch wild milkfish spawners in the early stages resulted in unacceptable mortality levels. Moreover, because milkfish is prone to stress, the adults that survived yielded degenerated eggs. Despite the problems, these early attempts yielded positive results. First, Methods to capture, transport, and domesticate wild milkfish were developed. Second, milkfish sustaining slight injuries during capture could still be induced to spawn. And third, fry collected from the wild was confirmed to be about 18 to 21 days old. The most important achievement in this period was done in 1977 at the Pandan and Tigbawan stations, where researchers simultaneously induced the spawning of milkfish by injecting two kinds of hormones, acetone-dried salmon pituitary homogenate and human cryonic gonadotropin. The eggs hatched 24 to 35 hours after fertilization. The following year, milkfish larvae were successfully reared to the fry stage and even further by using natural feed. Efforts in the succeeding years were geared mainly toward refining the induced spawning techniques and improvement of larval rearing methods. 
to assure a steady and predictable supply of spawners for induced spawning and larval rearing experiments, researchers shifted emphasis from wild spawners to gonadal rematuration of captive wild sabalo at Tigbawan and the development of a captive broodstock in Igang, using juvenile fish reared in Leganes Station from fry caught in the wild and raised in hatcheries. Results from the Igang experiments were encouraging. From June to September 1980, three to five-year-old brood stock kept in floating cages and fed with formulated high-protein feeds matured sexually. The brood stock came from fry gathered from the wild, raised at the Leganes experimental ponds, transferred to Igang in pens, and later in cages. All the fish in this batch matured. Spontaneous spawning first occurred in 1980 and then in the following years. Recently, in May and June 1983, five-year-old milkfish produced in Tigbawan in 1978 by injecting hormones on their wild parents spawned naturally in floating cages. Eggs from this spawn represented the second generation of milkfish raised entirely under captive conditions. Fry hatched from these eggs are now being reared to fingerling size in Tigbawan for eventual culture in the Leganes ponds. This achievement marks the completion or closing of the milkfish life cycle for the first time by man. To improve the present survival rate of 40% from the time fry are caught from the wild to the time they attain fingerling size, the department made studies on stunting techniques, salinity preferences, and freshwater acclimation. Techniques were developed to hold milkfish fry for 14 days without aeration and to transport fry at lower temperatures and salinities with survival rates of more than 90%. Deck research has demonstrated that higher survival rates of fry reared to fingerlings in brackish water nursery ponds can be obtained through supplemental feeding with rice bran, the use of nylon nets as additional substrates to increase natural food, and gradual acclimation of fry from seawater to the salinity of the water in the nursery pond. A method was also developed to acclimatize fry from seawater to fresh water with minimum mortality. This step reduces mortality during transport. Often, production from a given pond area may be augmented without any corresponding increase in acreage. This is attained by increasing stocking density, but it requires levels of inputs which may bloat production costs and in the end make the price of fish too high for the consumer. Progressive fish farmers and sea deck researchers therefore began to look for alternatives. An important advance in this direction has been the introduction of a modular pond system consisting of a series of three ponds adjoining each other with areas progressing in one is to two is to four proportions. It works this way. Once growth of fish in the smaller pond can no longer be sustained, they are transferred to the next bigger pond and the recently emptied pond is prepared for the next batch of fish. Six to eight harvests a year are possible. The yearly national average production of milkfish in brackish water ponds is 700 to 800 kilos a hectare. Using the modular culture system and lub-lub method, the department has demonstrated that an annual yield of not less than 2 tons per hectare can be obtained. Recently, the FinFish program of the Aquaculture Department was organized. Its goal is to solve some of the constraints to the expansion or intensification of the finfish industry. The program aims to develop brood stock of good quality for milkfish, tilapia, gray mullet, sea perch or sea bass, rabbit fish, silver carp, big head carp, and common carp. Refine and standardize techniques for the mass production of fish seeds. Develop techniques to catch, transport and store fish seeds with minimum mortality, improve existing culture techniques so that production can be maximized with minimum inputs, develop practical diets for the different life stages of the species, and identify parasites, diagnose diseases, and develop control methods. 
With these objectives, the department has set the research machinery on finfish rolling along three fronts, broodstock development, seed production, and fish culture. The development of the milkfish broodstock at the Igang substation in Gilmaras Island will continue. Experiments will be made on induced spontaneous spawning of milkfish in deep tanks to facilitate the recovery of fertilized eggs. Cheap and effective methods will be tested for sperm preservation. Studies will also be done to improve fertilization rates. In seed production, fertilized eggs of milkfish will be transferred, incubated, and hatched in tanks to produce the first larvae which will be reared to fry stage using natural feeds. New hatchery facilities will be used for the seed production of milkfish as well as other species of finfish. Nursery facilities shall be maintained for the milkfish fry. Improved techniques which would result in higher survival and growth rates have to be devised and standardized. Studies to assess and improve the nutritional value of natural foods will be initiated in conjunction with fry feeding biology. As to studies on fish culture, milkfish production remains a largely traditional practice in brackish water ponds and in freshwater fish pens in Laguna de Bay. To further develop the industry, economically feasible production technology must be found. Further testing and refinement of the modular method of milkfish pond culture and evaluation of its economic performance will be undertaken. The effects of stocking density on production will be evaluated. Supplementary feeding, in addition to natural algal food, will be tried. Experiments will be designed to find out if it is economically feasible from the standpoint of the farmer as well as the consumer. In summary, a decade of research at the Aquaculture Department has brought us closer to the ultimate goal of completely domesticating the milkfish. By such a feat, we should then be able to manipulate its biology and entirely control its reproduction and growth. We can then say that science has finally brought the milkfish from the wild to the farm. Translated to social benefit, this scientific achievement would mean greater values derived from this hardy national fish.